You take care. Hey, Eric, how you doing? Doing good. Although I was wondering if you sent this uh, case out specifically to give me a headache. Yes, I did. It's painful, yeah. isn't it? It is. It's tough to it's tough to go through. That's why I figured today could go really well or be a really sh a big shit show. So I'm not quite sure which one it's going to be yet. But I figured, hey, we'll take a we'll take we'll take a swing at it. What I figured we'd do is again, like we're not gonna try and do is do what they're doing. We're gonna go through it as we would go through it, take the piece of information and translate it. Yep. And probably because you're gonna read so many different things from so many different people. And it's like, well, this person's talking about this and that person's talking about that. And the hardest part is translating it into what we've learned. So the goal with this today is to not get too wrapped up in maybe how they're doing it. But to go through it, like, this is kind of how we go through it. And we'll look at these same things. We'll just do it in our way. Yeah, I definitely think there's some things that we can look at from a perspective of, you know, okay, this is where the patient's having symptoms. Mm -hmm. This is a particular movement that reproduces symptom A or symptom B or whatever. And, you know, what does that particularly tell us um, as far as what might be causing the pain? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think there's some things we can take out of it for sure. Yeah, some of the some of the phrasing they had in here, I was just like, oh my god, I don't even know what they're saying. Yeah, and you have to translate it out. So we'll just stop a second, translate it out. Hopefully, it doesn't confuse everyone too much. But hey, you know, Phil Sizer and Jean Michel Brisby, both super smart people, teach at Texas Tech. You know, John Michel is a program director of another fellowship program. I know him well. I've reviewed his program. Real smart dude. So we're gonna kind of go through it and kind of uh. Just kind of piece through it. Guys, ask as many questions as you can because what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and ask you questions. So be ready. First part about it is this case is about somebody who has multiple level dysfunctions. You know, there's multiple things going on in this person. And the general concept is, is when I have somebody who has so much going on, you know, how do I take an approach and tease out what I can find from a, a, a manual therapy standpoint and generally you think about this patient if you had the time to read the case is that if you go from occiput down to basically ct junction is where they went with a with an active passive resistive exam then looking at biomechanics you're basically coming up with your information and what you're going to treat from a uh, biomechanical standpoint and that's what they've done they're just approaching it a different way we'll talk about it from Harris. I think here in this first section where they talk about, you know, Winkle and clinically categorizing cervical disorders by locations and symptoms, you know, with each etiology, I think it's confusing because it's yet just another system of how they're looking at the, the, the neck. What I want to do is just kind of break it down to say, okay, here's another system, but here's how it always comes back to the things that we're talking about. So a local cervical syndrome, as they talked about in there, presents this local neck pain due to either primary or secondary disc related conditions you know primary disc conditions are going to be pain generators from the disc secondary conditions are going to be degenerative changes related from disc degeneration that's that idea that many times when somebody has a cervical facet oncovertebral joint problem there's usually a, a degenerative process that's driving these structures to bear weight or move with an abnormal axis of rotation they refer to primary and secondary around the disc. Your biomechanical dysfunctions sometimes are your are your kind of secondary. Jim talked about that early on, I believe, and we, Eric probably did too, or I, is that, you know, generally for the facet joint, the lumbar spine, to start bearing excessive weight or load and start the derangement process, there's usually a disc degenerative process going on that allows that facet joint to bear weight and cause that syndrome, the system breakdown. 
the cervical or local cervical syndrome is no different. They're just putting a different moniker on it as we see it. So within this, you would see either in your, you know, disc dysfunction in your, in your, you know, differential diagnosis or your hypothesis, or you're leading to your mechanical dysfunction as a secondary disc related disorder. And you hear that symptom, you hear that phrase, it's just about understanding it and what we've been talking about. They're just kind of subclassifying it. Is that kind of how you would read it, Eric? Yeah, more or less. I mean, it, you know, I, I think that we make things a little easier when we're looking at, you know, we have segmental dysfunction, we have yes. disc pathology, you know, things of that sort mm -hmm. of nature. And, and, and when you're breaking down the classification system, like the way that they're doing here, um, I, I don't know that you're gaining much by doing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, you know, how you're either diagnosing or treating things, um, because they don't really reference this later on when they're going through their diagnostic process too yes. much. So it's just like, okay, you know, if they want to spend the extra time to put labels on it like that, then that's fine. They can do whatever they want, but I, I'm not seeing a lot of benefit in doing it. Um, but, you know, that's just the way they do it. It's not hurting anybody. Yeah. Other than my head. Yeah. It makes you think a little bit, but I'm going to do this is because it is helpful to understand you're going to see these different things come up and you're going to hear it different whether you're looking at a McKenzie approach or somebody else's approach or you know these things will come up in these different ways and then it's just breaking it down to okay what are they really in sense talking about like something of this nature is you know they'll break it down later on as in like referred pain to somebody with basically a local dysfunction without ridiculous referred pain and in essence, when they're looking at this local dysfunction they'll use another subcategory later on to talk about that you know and then there's your biomechanicals your zygopathic seal joints your oncovertebral joint dysfunctions falling into this category. Cervical brachial syndrome encompasses symptoms in the cervical region as well as both the upper extremities. This is a way, I mean, really what we're talking about here is radicular symptoms in a sense. Uh, and again, I don't know that they're differentiating, you know, radiculopathy, radicular pain, or somatic pain as well. I'd have to read a little further to see, are they differentiating between those? Well, here they're saying, if the upper extremity pain is emerging from the nerve root irritation, I would assume that it'd be radicular or neural pain. Yeah, that's what I got out of it too. I don't think they mention anything that suggests somatic referral. Yeah, I don't see it in here either. So now that I, I read it again right now. So I would leave, I would think the somatic referral would probably for another category, but that's where we're going a little, maybe a step further. Cause I get, okay, I get somebody who's pain into their shoulder and upper extremity. One of the first things I'm doing is I'm sorting, okay, you know, neuropathic, radicular, somatic pain. You know, what am I dealing with here? And that's going to dictate, okay, do I go, what structure or area what's going on? And again, somebody has somatic pain, it, it can develop into radicular symptoms later on as the inflammation or compression around the nerve progresses they may shift into one of the other categories. Yeah. I mean, I, I always look at it from a perspective of the terminology I use is I, I'll use the term radiating pain and mm -hmm. referred pain. And I use them separately. Radiating pain is something that happens that peripheralizes immediately with movement of the trunk. So whether it's the lumbar spine or the neck or whatever it may be. So you're moving a spinal segment and it immediately radiates pain into the limb. Um, that would suggest more neurological components, right? That would, you know, suggest more compression, tension, inflammation, any of those sort of things that would actually produce a radicular type of symptoms into the limb. A referred pain would be more of something that requires repetitive stress or sustained stress in order to produce the refer reference. So, you know, this is the person that falls asleep laying on their stomach with their head rotated to the side and they sleep in that position for six hours and they wake up with pain into the arm. Um, but it's not immediate. It requires that sustained pressure or repetitive type of movement, you know, rotating the head multiple times or something of that sort of nature um, to produce that reference. I, I think that's an easier way of looking at things for, you know, radiculopathy versus somatic reference into the limb where you can say, well, this is a radiating symptom, something that occurs immediately. As soon as I move the head, bang, there it is. It shoots down the arm versus if I have to do it 20, 30 times with a particular activity, like driving my car, for instance, or, you know, looking down with reading a book, 
um, or sleeping with my head, you know, kind of twisted off to the side, those things would be more of a referenced pain, more of the somatic type of uh, dysfunction. Yeah. And again, next one, they have a cervicocephalic syndrome, which is produces, you know, pain both in the neck and head, including headaches, dizziness, tinnitus, you know, these systems are talking about it was arising from articular ligamentous, neurological, vascular organic origins, typically going to be upper cervical, upper cranial vertebral region. You know, we're looking at C3 and above for these things. So no, no different than what we talked about probably a lot of the case of last week, where we looked at dizziness and some of the neck and cervical symptoms. And again, cervical medullary syndrome. Now we're talking about, you know, something's going to press on the canal in the cord. We're looking at something pretty significant here. If we're looking at that. Looking at a large posterior disc herniation, some type of you know mechanical disruption of the spinal cord that's compressing it, which is a, which is a completely different animal. Oh, right. Probably not something you want to mess with in your clinic. Yeah, that's definitely not something you want. But you know, from there, them. yeah, they kind of went through different things. Like, okay, cervical syndrome. Okay, disc primary, secondary. Is it the disc is inflamed and irritated, or do I have mechanical dysfunction? driving it because of the weight bearing through there. You know, cervical brachial syndrome, they're really referring to that as, okay, this person's progressed and they're getting, you know, nerve root irritation into the arm. Cervical cephalic, this is upper cranial vertebral region, something up in a upper cranial vertebral dysfunction, driving it up into what we talked about there. Also including things that might cause transdermal facilitation or doing it. And finally, we have basically cord compression, which is no bueno. So, we want to take their system down. You see how their system, we understand everything they're talking about. But when people put fancy labels on things, it's very normal at first immediate flush. Oh, God, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know this. But we do. It's just translating the language of somebody else's classification system into what we're already doing. There's no secret diagnosis that you've not been exposed to. Medical diagnosis that we're not common or familiar to us as PPs. Nothing in these disorder here, something that you haven't seen, you can't do. No. Again, they'll go into oncovertebral joint, the set joint mechanics, and we've covered that extensively, so no need to review that here. We've also covered uh, intervertebral discs and the clefting phenomenon that goes on between the oncovertebral joints, the mid-cervical clefting, which forms kind of a pseudo joint, and we've covered that also as well there. So. No need to really revert this anatomy. Here's the one spot where they use their own terminology before they move on from it. All right, Patrick. So real quick, Chris Patrick, 45-year-old female, presents a clinic with long history of cervicocephalic and local cervical symptoms. What does that tell you? Where her, where her symptoms? Come on, Patrick, you can do it. Do faster. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Um, so that's telling us that the symptoms appear to be coming from the neck. If she's yep. having uh, local cervical pain as well as the cervicocephalic. Yeah. What about 20 year history of daily headaches? It began the morning that she works and worsens as she progresses. Um, but probably putting too much stress on her neck, um, either postural or based on depending what her work is, causing yeah. increased stress on probably the suboccipital muscles. Yeah. So now you're thinking upper cranial vertebral joints when you hear that. Okay. I know I'm going to look at those anyway, but when you're thinking headaches and everything, you'll do it. Okay. She's working full time as a bookkeeper you know, and florist, you know, catering business, you know, symptoms worsen with lifting, reading, hand, hand computations, computer use, and you're reaching six out of 10, visual analog scale headaches would reduce to a tolerable level only when she would sleep for 45 minutes during her shift. That is awesome. Her lunch break, she says. Okay. Teresa, any additional information in there that, that leads you to think of what you may look at or what you think this person's kind of experiencing? From just the history you're talking? Yeah, just yeah. from right there. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. It's okay. Like, kind of this just what that, am I? What am I? Yeah, what do you think? She has pain with postural things, lifting, reading, computer use, yeah. headaches okay. when she's at work. What does that make you kind of think about this individual? Sure. Um, repetitive stresses, some sort of segmental um, dysfunction, right? That yeah. there's a stuck segment that she's working around it and trying to compensate, especially the fact that she lays down for 45 minutes and um, that takes away that that headache for her every day at work you know that that's that tension is building up by midday and then she lays down in a supported position where that joint or those muscles are not being stressed and they get to take the load off and the stress off and they improve yeah that's that's essentially it's just kind of taking those simple things she's not not terrible she's able to reduce the pain with position of ease which is which is a good thing in a way but still we got to figure out how does she sort this so she can be more functional in her day yeah, it kind of tells us it's this is pretty functionally debilitating for her, mm -hmm. right? You know, like go to work, it hurts worse. You got to to the, to the point where you have to lay down at lunch and sleep for forty five minutes just to get through the rest of your day. That's it's pretty substantial when you think about that. And again, it's, if you look, Chan, she's got pain on the right side with uh, headaches that would extend, uh, extend on the right retroorbital region. Again, what does that make you feel like? I got pain on the right side. Common symptoms would be worse on the right. And the headaches would frequently extend on the right retroorbital region. Is that consistent with what you'd want to think about with something that might be segmental? Yeah, you're just looking at the upper cervical, upper, upper cervical spine as possibly the, the generators as far as uh, causing the pain. Yeah, so it kind of strengthens that. What's the importance of coupling and uncoupling? Though? Those two things are coupled. Does that make you feel good or does that make you feel a little queasy? Uh, it makes me feel better in the sense of they're, yeah. that with uh, with movements or and that's all on that one side, it seems like. Yeah, yeah by more, if it was a case of trauma, that coupling becomes by more important. But once I hear it here, it's kind of like, okay, it just strengthens the idea that this is, you know, in some way we're going to find something biomechanically. And again, there'll be some portion of muscle guarding, muscle imbalance. All those things will be present there as well. We It's, it's in the research. We know it. It's just a matter of also, do we have a mechanical driver that we need to be addressing if we're coming early on? And doesn't experience any sharp shooting pains, nor create any numbness in face, upper extremities. Well, she's, you know, a patient did experience dizziness. She did not have drop attack, diplopolis, agents, arthria. So what are they telling us there, Ariel? What are they trying to tell us anyway? With the drop attacks? Just that whole line. You know, so no, no, no facial numbness, upper extremity numbness, no, you know, occasional dizziness, but no drop attacks, diplopia, dysphagia, et cetera. What, what is Cranial that? Cranial nerves are okay. Probably. Yeah. Right. We're not, there's nothing reported there that would suggest impairment of one of the cranial nerves. Right. And what, what might that suggest if there was some impairment? Sorry, say that again. If there was some impairment, right? So if they did have yeah. a history of drop attacks or double vision or any of that sort of stuff, what what other type of dysfunction in the neck or, that we're usually concerned with is she likely yeah. not experiencing? A VBI, uh, yeah, uh, VBI. Right. Yeah. And and what's the other thing that probably right there in the second line of the patient history that tells us it's probably not VBI? It's a long history of headaches. Yeah, 20 years she's been experiencing VBI symptoms for 20 years and nothing significant has happened as a result of that. It tends to take you away from something like that, right? It tends to make us think, well, with that length of time, the odds of her having some some neurovascular problem um, is pretty slim, I would think, without especially considering she's had multiple workups, all these different things, um, where there wouldn't be something that would be suspicious by that stage. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but these aren't the only potential symptoms that you could have with ver uh, vertebral artery compromise, right? You know, dizziness, there's been some reports that suggest that every case of vertebral artery compromise comes with some form of dizziness, um, but it doesn't tell us anything about type. Um, she does have some dizziness, right? So it's a transient thing. It's occasional. They said it is associated with movement of her head and neck, 
So that could potentially rule in neurovascular issues. Um, but, you know, they start ruling out these other potential issues, drop attacks, double vision, um, trouble with swallowing, speaking, et cetera. Um, but there are other symptoms that can come along with that, um, perhaps that are more suggestive of vertebral artery compromise than what they have listed here, right? So dizziness we know is a significant one that's often present with VBI. But what else is there? What else, what else is possible here, Darryl? At least, do you have any other potential symptoms that you can run into that you might want to mention here or ask the patient about? Well, I want to probably ask about the increased pain or uh, symptoms with lifting. It seems like it's coming on with sedentary and non-sedentary tasks, but may, I would want to are they the same when she's lifting versus reading and him um, and the computer use, or are they different at the time? A, and that's going to be helpful for us differentiating what's going on with the patient, but that's, that's not specific to what I'm, I'm wondering about oh, with sorry. VBI stuff. What other symptoms can we ask about potentially for VBI? Because they give us a list here, right? And drop attacks, all the, the four Ds, they five Ds yeah. they have listed there. But there's other things that are actually more specific to VBI. And it's okay if you don't have them all memorized right now. I'll, I'll just give them to you. So sure. perioral paresthesia, so numbness around the lips, is a very significant symptom. There's a very particular uh, arterial that comes off of the, I think it's actually the basilar artery, that supplies that portion of the trigeminal uh, sensation. Yeah. For the Didn't face. you say something with like... um flush or redness to the face also well so what would that what would that imply right so yes that could be one but what there's a syndrome that that's associated with i don't remember sorry horner's. Is it... a horner syndrome where you get flush oh, yeah, yeah, out yeah, of the face yeah. right yep um, but that certainly can be something that can come with vertebral artery compromise as long as it's affecting portions of the stellate ganglia and whatnot. Um, but certainly can have those sort of things because um, Horner syndrome can come along with things like uh, lateral medullary syndrome, which is basically the lower portions of the brainstem are being affected. Um, and that certainly is, is a potential symptom of vertebral artery compromise. We have perioral paresthesias. We have the dizziness, right? Um, ataxia is another big thing as it starts to affect the cerebellum. We can have um, nystagmus, particularly lateral nystagmus, as it starts to affect the sixth cranial nerve. Uh, for whatever reason, that one seems to have a very substantial um, effect when there's a loss of vascularity to that particular uh, nuclei. Um, so we'll get this kind of lateral ticking um, of a nystagmus there. Um, what's the other one that I was thinking of? So we have nystagmus, perioral paresthesias. Um, facial numbness, so and quadrilateral paresthesias, things of that sort of nature that start affecting multiple regions of the body. Okay, so they gave us a decent list here. It's kind of that typical, hey, we've got those five Ds, but there's others that actually are probably more important for us to be asking about because they're more typically associated with vertebral artery compromise. Dave, I know you know, you you're all in on those, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you know. We have it in there. We talk about Horner syndrome, but it's it's it, you know, Horner syndrome is one of the things you never see, but it's that's why you gotta kind of remember to ask because those would be those atypical things where okay, this this just isn't matching. This isn't a normal typical presentation. It's just like it's perioral numbness. They're not gonna be shy to tell you that because it's just kind of crazy. And like, hey, I got this crazy thing. Tell me what's going on. So that's not something people keep quiet when they have these odd sensations. So it's just that other layer of doing it. You see these big things. But then you're going to find these and you should find these in your, if you go into a cranial vertebral exam. Like those would be the odd ones that should be positive. So we go headaches that are kind of well described, you know, originating, you know. You know. Now, she what she also describes in here too is that sometimes she gets migraine headaches, well, which is deep and throbbing. She talked about it originating, occipital temporal region of the head. You're triggered by strong smells, loud noises. You know, creating problems for her in her catering business and business environments. She's reducing medications, prolonged sleep, assist for three to four hours, forcing her to stay home. 
I believe also she mentions in here that she also gets the aura and severe photosensitivity. So you now you have two different ones. You have a potential cervogenic headache overlaid with migrainous headache. They're giving us. Giving and there us is some suggestion that trigeminal facilitation can actually affect and, and reproduce migraines as well. Yes. Change right. in vascularity through the um, carotid sinus is one of the things that kind of suggests that sort of stuff. Um, but it is something that can be affected by supposedly, at least it's not proven, but there is some um, theories out there that that's a possibility that those can be wound up even worse from trigeminal uh, symptom changes. Yeah, that's a good point. Is like the migraine, the migraine headaches overlap with some of the trigeminal facilitation. Is like there, there's some coactivation. You'll see like when they talk about trying to isolate one thing, the headache that's typical to migraine. You're going to find it in other types of headaches. So that's when we looked at kind of the tension type headaches, cervogenic, migrainous headaches. Like there was a lot of overlap in what you're going to see. But, you know, the aura, the photophobia, photosensitivity is typical of the migraine headache. But some of your same triggers for the other types of headaches will be present in the migrainous headaches as well. And again, in here in the history, they're also going to go over, you know, typical chronic history of mid-cervical pain and pain in the uh, interscapular region. Again, pain more common on the right side, you know, occasionally on the left. Increased with her typical headache syndromes or worse. So you're seeing a coupling of these symptoms as well. Even though they're talking about mid-lower cervical symptoms, they're going to be tied together. You can, have a, you can have a lower cervical driver or a thoracic driver of upper cranial vertebral joints that could be present in this individual. And again, you got sharp pain when turning her head to the right. So you're going to see that right rotation going to drive some of these symptoms. So as soon as my turned right, Chris, you think what's happening at occiput C1, C2, C3, just to start with. So this person has pain symptoms when they're turning to the right. What is C1 doing on C2? Chris, you lucky dog, you're up. Um, uh, mm -hmm. The, the um, Z joint would be closing on the right. On which joint? C1, um, C2, C2, C3. Um, C1, C2. How is C1, C2 unique compared to the other cervical joints? Um, just the angle of the facets. Yeah, what are the facets? What's the contour of the right C1, C2 joint? Do you recall how it's different than 2, 3 and the rest of them? Um, um, not at the moment. Yeah, it's tricky to be on. It's tricky to be on the spot. Now, remember the C one, C two is kind of like having a convex surface on a convex surface. You know, you have two domes okay. sitting on top of each other, and what this joint allows for is in rotation. So you're going to get thirty eight to forty degrees, depending on who you read a rotation from C one, C two joint. So it's not your typical, as it described in its article later on, that joint orientation, your facet joints will be oriented more like this in this plane here, whereas you're going to be looking at one ball on top of another ball, your hands aren't great balls, and you're looking at C1, C2 in rotation. So that's what we talk about when we look code to the right. C1 on the right-hand side is going to go posterior and down the back slope on C2 because we have that convex on convex shape created by the articular surfaces. At 2, 3, we're going to go into extension of C2 onto C3 at that segment. We kind of bring it down into those joints there. So C1, C2, when I hear that, okay, they have pain with rotation, I start to think, now it can be in the mid-cervical spine. This can go as low as the thoracic spine. And go down in there. But C1, C2, I think of the shape of C1, C2, can it do that? And then I'm going to take it down. There's other joints. Can it not close, as you talked about, which would be the C2, C3 shape? Okay, Ryan. What we have a, let's, let's skip over the mid cervical spine, go to the thoracic spine. If this person was stiff at end range rotation and you get tight right there, head stays fairly level. Tell me about what's going on at the thoracic spine. What happens at, let's say, T1, T2, T2, T3? T3 segment to contribute to right rotation. 
Yeah, and that upper thoracic spine. I would expect the, there to be a similar movement as the lower cervical spine. So the upper thoracic or T1 rotating slightly to the right on T2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about, what's the, as it rotates to the right, what's relative right facet joint doing of T1 on T2? And what's also potentially happening at the rib or costo transverse joint? Be a relative extension of T1 on T2 mm -hmm. on the right. Mm -hmm. And then you said the costo transverse joint? Yeah. Um, so it would be like a talking at T1 as it rotates to the right. Mm -hmm. So it would be a relative left rotation. Or a T1 um, stiff, but if, yeah. Two should be a little more. Typical. What was that? Yeah. Now I was just thinking like T1 sometimes because it's much stiffer joint at both segments than the, the second and the lower ribs. There's a lot more stable joint. But it's a tough one to say there on those mechanics. The idea is that the ribs would roll backward and the, the that point the rotation, the train, the costo, the transverse process is somewhat moving on the rib as the rib is also rotating. But the model is, is that as I rotate this way, I'm, I'm going to get rotation of the ribs, kind of similar to what my nominance would do, going to that right rotation. So at that segment, what we'll be looking at is the ability of segment to translate to the, to the left and rotate to the right, which is what they assess later in this article, just by palpating the spinous process and seeing could they palpate the two spinous processes separating. They looked at, and then they also looked at the rib glide in this one. And what they did, so it's another this, thing that gave me a headache. Yeah, the way they did it inside, the way they described it. Yeah, I had to read it twice just to get a sense. I know it's going to make sense just how to, how to do it. What we wouldn't really do is just get on there and do a rib glide. You do superior inferior, but I would do ventral medial dorso lateral glides for the ribs to make yeah. sure that those ribs have their full mobility. Yeah, so when, when you guys are looking at the rib, the ring, right? So if we're looking at it from the top down, you know, kind of looking at it from a vertical perspective, as we rotate to the right, we should get this sort of movement, right? Well, everything is going to translate to the left. The vertebra is going to rotate to the right, right? We're going to get that sort of movement. Now, if we have the rib sitting in there, right? So here's our costo transverse joint between my thumb um, and this and my other thumb here, right? So what happens is as this rotates to the right, we're going to relatively get an anterior medial or a ventromedial glide of that costo transverse joint on the ipsilateral side. Okay. On the contralateral side, then we're going to get, we're still going to be getting this right rotation. Relatively, it's going to be this posterior lateral glide that's occurring. So if I rotate right, the right rib should go anterior medial, the left rib should go posterior lateral. Okay. That should occur whether I'm rotating with my head or rotating with my trunk. Okay. And those are mechanics we need to know because that will affect things like inspiration, and expiration. Okay. And they should match up. We have a patient that turns their head to the right and they say, yeah, I feel a pain in the interscapular region. Okay. That could very easily be a costo transverse joint issue, right? If I ask them to rotate their trunk and they say, yeah, I get that same pain in the uh, interscapular region. So say it's on that right side. Then if I ask them to take a deep breath in, they get nothing. But if I ask them to take a long forced breath out, they reproduce it again. Now I'm pretty confident that I have head or head neck rotation, trunk rotation, and uh, expiration. So a, a ventilatory mechanism. Pretty comfortable saying that that reproduction is going to be due to costo transverse joint problems, irritation, damage, maybe even subluxation, something of that sort of nature. Coupling those three things together, when we start to make those types of um, bundles of type of movement patterns that, that give us reproduction of symptoms or limitation of movement um, uh, as well, it points us in a particular direction, right? We like those things because it increases the probability that we're looking at the right thing. Does that fit? You guys okay with that? I know we've been talking about that a little bit on and off since the third module of the thoracic module. Hey, Eric, just to clarify, so if I'm rotating right, I am 
rib is technically kind of actually rotating uh, anterior lateral, correct? No, the anterior medial. Anterior medial, excuse me. Yep. Uh, okay. So if you're talking about the same side rib, right? So if I'm rotating right and we're talking about, the say, the right second rib, yeah, so we'd be getting anterior medial uh, glide at the costotransverse joint. Okay. I, 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 I thought you said it differently, but I probably heard that wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, I hope not. I, it, that's what it should be, right? Yeah, so the okay. same side, the ipsilateral side, if I'm rotating right, the right rib should be anterior medial. The contralateral side, the left rib then would be posterior lateral. Okay. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. Thank you. Gotcha. Good. Eric, when you started talking about this, I was thinking to myself that that right side, I would get an imp and on the left side, I would get a sal. So where am I getting confused that the imp and scale come in? That's the play? facet joint. That's the facet joint. Oh, okay. And we're talking costo transverse. Yep. We're talking rib. Okay. Yep. So you're correct. If I if I rotate my head to the right, the right side should be an imp, right? Okay. The facet joint should go inferior, medial, posterior, opposite side, contralateral side, side should go superior, anterior, lateral. So you got okay. that. It's just rib versus facet. Okay. Kind of really where you drill this one down through the intrascapular pain, seeing with the right rotation is, you know, your primary you're going to look at is going to be set joint, costo transverse joint motion. It's and there's, a couple of things, there's a couple of things here that can be suggestive. So when we get interscapular pain with neck movement, right, there's really two major things that I think of um, as far as being the pain producer. Number one would be something in the thorax. So costo transverse joint, maybe a facet joint, uh, maybe a ring lesion, something of that nature could be potentially the, uh, the, the pain producer in that sort of situation. The other is a reference pain from one of the cervical segments. And it's usually C5, C6 that'll reference kind of right down along the medial scapular border. Um, and this particular case kind of has both. Right. When we get down to it and we boil it down, we go through the physical exam and they look at their findings. They have upper thoracic issues that could be contributing to um, interscapular pain, but they also have something, what I forget what they were calling it, a kyphotic kink or something like that. Is that what they were saying? Yeah. Dave? Is that yeah, the like terminology they were using? at the five, six segment, which yeah, was that, flattening the, the uh, would, cervical lordosis. Yeah. And that would also be something that pr could produce a referenced pain into that interscapular region. So, one way or the other, one of those two things is probably causing it. Now, if you have dysfunction in both, your your uh, specific segmental tests should be able to tell you that, right? If I go in and I do a pivum pavum on you know T three on T four, and it reproduces the same interscapular pain, okay, that that seems to suggest that that's the thing that's causing it. If I do the glide on the ribs, anterior medial, posterior lateral, whichever one maybe we may be suspicious of. And that reproduces it. Okay, there, there we go. If I go up and I do a translatory pivum or a, a you know a more specific gliding pavum of C five on C six, and that reproduces it. Okay, good. You know that, but we should be able to tell these things with our segmental tests um, in order to tell us which one is likely to be able to alleviate that interscapular pain. And this person's dealing with multiple things, right? When we get to their physical examination, they're going through active range of motion testing. It's like, well, if I look, if I side bend to the left and rotate to the right, I get a pain in one area. If I side bend to the right and rotate to the left, I get a pain in another area. So there's all kinds of different things here that are that are irritated, that are producing different types of different locations of pain for this person, which seems to fit with the idea that this person's had issues for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's multiple structures that have started to break down as a result. Right. We're not looking for one particular thing that's causing one particular symptom. There's a lot of different ones here in this particular type of patient. And these patients will walk through your door. You'll see patients like this. I see patients like this all the damn time. And it's, sometimes it's frustrating because um, you want to try and simplify things, but it's not always that it's not always that easy to do that, uh, depending on where the where things have started to fall apart for them. Yeah, <laughs> maybe like to... maybe I glazed over it but did they go into shoulder strength much or did they only go into cervical strength when they were doing some like motor testing i don't remember seeing anything about motor testing the problem that i have with most people's force output testing that they do is they don't they don't vary it the way that we do right so and they probably aren't doing it repetitively looking for 
neurological weakness, right? So with fatigability. So a lot of times I'll, gl I'll gloss over that stuff anyway. You know, they'll say, oh, there's no, si no signs of, um, you know, segmental weakness or something of that sort of nature. But it doesn't, the way that most, the way that most systems look at force output testing, they'll just go, go and they'll do one test and they'll say, okay, it was clean and I got good strength out of it and I got good resistance out of it. And that's all they look at where we, we kind of know at this stage, after going through these, these various modules that we have to do repetitive testing to look for fatigability. We have to do velocity dependence testing, looking for facilitation and, it, you know, you know, breaking local weakness or pain uh, inhibition, things of that sort of nature should come up right away with they, probably the first test that we do to, for it. Um, so sometimes it's pretty easy to gloss over some of the force output testing stuff when you're seeing cases like this that are written up because they don't do it the same way we do. But I personally, I really feel that muscle testing, um, or if you want to call it strength testing, I, I tend to call it force output testing because it's variable in how we're looking at it or what might be causing the deficit. Um, I think it's one of the best tests that we can do. I mean, especially for the lower quadrant. I think the lower quadrant, we really find a lot of stuff with that. I think sometimes with the upper quadrant, it's a little difficult because of shoulder girdle problems and things of that sort of nature, being able to find good anchor points and whatnot. But I really think it's a, a very important test that we do. But I think, I do think they mentioned it, but I think it's a brief, like one sentence thing that they said, you mm -hmm. know, we didn't see anything segmental suggesting yeah. Um, you know, neurologic weakness or anything like that. I was surprised by that. I, I find she, this case specifically was a little bit more extreme, you know, with the chronicity and intensity of the headaches, like having to take a nap every single day at work. But I find this so often in my middle age females with that like bra strap line pain that goes up that periscapular area to um, CTJ. And I guess her pain was a little bit more um like upper cervical but and these females are just like so weak in their shoulders they have no strength nothing supporting their neck and all they have to do is strengthen the hell out of their shoulders and it fixes all their problems mm -hmm. think about it do you think it's really that you that they were made stronger or do you think you improved and facilitated their patterning you know. Oh yeah, totally. It's it's probably all en encompassing, yeah. and I'm still mobilizing all of mm -hmm. you know their onco joints when I'm doing yeah. all that too. So yeah. who knows which one it is? But yeah. I just thought it was interesting they didn't they didn't um you know take that into factor in testing. Yeah. I bet she probably looks like you're describing, and they they put enough information in there just to rule out neurological weakness. They didn't include information on exactly what you would see, Teresa, which I think exactly what you would find. Yeah, and 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 some of these things you have to even reposition shoulder the shoulder girdle itself, right? Because mm -hmm. we've talked about this this idea of regional inhibition. I think it's a term it's a term that's not really in any of our unless it's stuff that I've written up, but um, it, it's not in a lot of the curriculum stuff, and it's not in a lot of the literature. But the idea of not having a good anchor and not having a good foundation to base um, some of these strength tests off of, because if we're if we're sitting here, you know, with the arm in a 90, you know, kind of this neutral position at the side, 90 degrees of the elbow, and we're doing rotator cuff strengthening to look at, you know, five or six, or um, we're doing, you know, deltoid testing in that position, looking at five and, you know, basically it's a very neutral position. We may not get the same type of breaking regional inhibition that we would get if we're testing things out here, right? Because now we've, we've forced the shoulder girdle to alter its position and we force it to try and anchor better with the arm away from the trunk, right? So we may get false negatives when it comes to some of that force output testing. If we're doing those tests in this very neutral, very, um, you, you know, kind of unloaded type of position for the shoulder itself, um, so I do, you know, you wonder about that sort of stuff when we, especially when you're looking at literature like this and it's just like, well, you know, what position are they doing these tests in, you know, are they, are they doing repetitive testing? Are they doing specific velocity dependence and that sort of stuff? So it, it gets a little hazy, um, you know, when you're looking at that sort of stuff, because I think it tells us a lot, right? I mean, if we get immediate breaking weakness, then we're, we're thinking, well, there's a local problem or some sort of regional problem, right? And that, tells us that it's it's more out here, right? It's more in the shoulder girdle, it's may, maybe potentially in the upper rib cage, but it's less likely to be neurological, it's less likely to be a facilitation. 
But if we're doing repetitive testing, you know, and particularly getting speed dependence testing in there, and that shows up as positive, then we're then we're thinking, well, there is a spinal component that's associated with this weakness. So I, I just think it tells us so much um, potentially when we're looking at that force output testing to not be specific about how we're doing it, right? And that, you know, that that's just not the way these these therapists do their examination. And that's okay as long as they're getting to an answer that provides um, you know, results for their patients. But there's definitely the possibility as they're going through some of, as we're looking through some of their treatments and whatnot, and they're saying, oh, you know, these things have improved and, you know, maybe strength improves and all this sort of stuff. It's like, well, are they getting that based off of the mobilizations they're doing? Are they getting that based off of the uh, strengthening that they're doing, the retraining that they're doing? We don't know because they're not postulating that this particular weakness is based off of this issue, you know, whether it's a cervical issue, a, a spinal issue, or if it's an anchoring issue with regional dependence stuff, or if it's a local pathology with an instability at the glenohumeral joint, they're not postulating that sort of stuff for us. So we have to make those assumptions based on our own um, kind of thought processes and how we look at things. Because um, we can make those sort of determinations clinically when we do these things, but we have to make those determinations kind of secondarily when we're looking at a, a, a case like this on paper. It's interesting stuff, though. I mean, it is interesting to kind of think about from a uh, perspective of how other therapists get their results um, versus how we're trying to get ours. We want to be able to be specific with it because then we can be more specific with our home exercise, our retraining things, that sort of stuff. And it makes us more efficient. I think, Teresa, you have a good point in there that, you know, we're going to clean up the manual side of it, but there's other things you saw. They'll get better temporarily when it's mechanical, but those other areas definitely need to be addressed. You'll see those people positively improve. Two things coupled together should get you a better outcome faster. But you still need that, oh, those other components of correction and, you know, we'll call it strengthening, but it can be neuromotor re-education or patterning, you know, kind of using them interchangeably. Yep. Interesting term here to go over it and I'll focus a little bit on some of the terminology they use is when they, they refer to the nodding. Now, when they refer to nodding, I had to think about that for a second, too, because I think my immediate thought goes to lateral bending. But when they talk about cervical nodding to the right, what they're really looking at doing is probably, probably cervical side bending, which would be kind of equivalent to if we're going to do a side bending test. What happens? Let's do a victim here. Kevin, what happens if I take the, the, the occiput and side bend it to the right? What happens at C1, C2? You're going to get a left translation of, of the right uh, occipital condyle on C1. Huh? A left, I would say a left translation. So right side bend. I'm going to get a little bit of a posture glide and left translation on the right. Posterior glide and left translations. C1 is going posterior. I think, I think you're talking about different segments here, guys. I think Kevin's talking about C, that, that oh. occiput on C1. Okay. And Dave's asking okay. about C1 on C2. Yeah. C1 um, on C2. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that kind of convex on convex, I, I think C1 is probably going to go anterior. Good guess. Like down the hill, I would say, yeah. on that convex convex. On which side? Same side uh, or the opposite yeah. side? Same side. So on the ipsilateral side. Yeah. yeah. Well, my thought too, when I hear the term nod, I think of that there's a there's what's called an OA nod or what's a CV motion where you'd have them rotate and then flex. And the verbiage is something like, hey, can you get your clavicle, mid-clavicle portion, or can you get to my fingertips on the side? So it's looking at that, I would say conjunct motion. Um <laughs> Yeah, at CV, but I realize your question is C1 on C2, but I think of that term nod as like all of that occurring together, and maybe that's what they're looking at. What are your guys' thoughts on that? That's why, that's why I broke it down to one, because you could go all the way two, three, or into the little mid-cervical spine with this. Yeah, I'm I'm totally with you on that, Kevin. When, I, when I'm reading this, right, so if that, that paragraph here on kind of the bottom right, and it says right cervical side nodding was moderately limited, and then the next sentence says right side bending was mildly limited. So they're clearly looking at these as two separate things, mm -hmm. right? So side nodding 
to me suggests, you know, that's C that's you know C0, so that's OA joint occurring here, right, at the CV region, versus side bending being the thing that occurs all the way down into the cervical spine. So I I agree with you that that would make more sense to look at it from the OA perspective. Um, because knowing that the AA joint, when we're looking at nodding of the head, it, it's pretty negligible. There's almost nothing that occurs at the OA joint, or sorry, the AA joint with flexion extension. And that's why we use things like combined motions of the upper cervical joints to differentiate between OA and AA um, movement dysfunctions, right? So if I, mm -hmm. if I nod, if I have a limitation of right rotation and I nod my head and that limitation gets worse, I'm suspicious it's an OA issue, not an AA issue. If it doesn't change with flexion or extension, so if that right rotation does not, uh, that right rotation limitation doesn't change with flexion or extension of the head, I'm suspicious it's going to be the AA because it doesn't change much. It's like a, it's like an unsonate joint, right? It's like a U joint. So those sort of things you have to take into consideration when we're looking at, you know, what they're describing here. I would go right with you and say that I would suspect they're talking about an OA movement there. Okay. It's a weird term, side nodding. And through me a bit, that's why Anna thought it's interesting because, you know, you read somebody else's work, it could be this or another article, and, you know, and think well i don't know what's going on but we do it's just translating what they're saying or right, the side bending again you could look at that i, I agree you're gonna have oa movement again you side bend enough it's also how you're going to test initiate the rotation test so tough thing to be specific i mean honestly i could see where you could think okay the early motion would be oa but again that side nod is not going to be specific it's how often are people just tilting their head and doing that pure motion they're eventually going to go into a bit of side bending component but they're looking at upper region versus the lateral flexion, which is the whole motion of the neck. That's just how they differentiate it. And what we can think about it is how we look at occiput C1, or we're going to look at C1 motion on C2. That's essentially kind of where I read into that, the nodding motion. Then, and that's why I like what I do, because I just bias occiput on C1, C1 on C2, versus using a nodding motion. I then have to go in there and do something mechanical to determine or biomechanical exam to see, okay, where is my dysfunction? What's what's the driver? But I can read this article and kind of back work in my mind. Okay, I see what they're doing and why they're doing it. I still have to look at occiput on C1, C1 on C2, and C2 on C3. Yeah. You know, left side nodding less painful, extension was hardly limited, producing severe pain, eight out of 10 in uh, left, interscapular region. So high pain, left interscapular region, you know, we extend the neck, you know, we're driving into those joints, but it can also be referred pain coming from the cervical level. Back in there, we talked about like Cloward's area. Two things at that point I'd be sorting. Is it a mechanical dysfunction that's in that area or do I refer to segmental pain? And there's right there on that bottom paragraph on the right that there's your, uh, Description there, Teresa, on, on the uh, mm. motor testing. Negative for motor or sensory disturbances. That was it. That's all they wrote. So, but what are the odds? This patient has obviously multiple level cervical involvement, probably upper thoracic involvement. What are the odds that this patient has zero force output test at force output limitations? It's a big fat zero. They're going to have yeah, multiple segments pretty cool. that are affected. Be pretty close yeah, to zero. No way they don't have. There's no way they don't have changes, right? And this this could be any number of things, right? So if we're looking at it like, okay, looks like C23 is going to be something that's affected on this patient. So number one, we're very likely to have tone changes for everything supplied by C3 and C4, right? So basically that's going to be the, the, the nerve that exits between C2 and C3 is the C3 nerve root, right? So that's going to be supplied. It's going to supply what? Levator scap? Levator scap tone change that's going to increase. So the top corner of that scapula is going to be elevated, right? So we're going to have deficiencies in movement of the shoulder girdle just related to that alone, right? We're going to have changes in how, because now that we've got this elevated here, out here where our gleno, um, glenoid rim is, all of a sudden that's going to be dumped downward, right? Now we have more tension, more effort that has to be put in by the rotator cuff, the superior portions of the rotator cuff. 
um, superior glenohumeral ligament, biceps tendon might be slackened off, all these different things. So obviously this patient is going to have force output issues. One way or the other, they're going to have it. But the way that they're looking at it, they're just looking at it for motor deficiencies, right? They're looking for it to say, does can this patient give me a contraction or not? Um, if they're not explaining it any more than that, they're not talking about repetitive or repetitive testing or any of that sort of stuff. That's what I have to assume is all they're looking at is can this muscle give me a contraction or not? Yeah. But there's zero chance that there's no motor motor impairments here or alterations here. Yeah. That's the the article is, you know, for concise to tell the story, simple thought. And they're just using that statement then to rule out, you know, okay, telling you that, okay, we don't see anything that's, that's any kind of neuropathy in here. Keep tendon reflexes normal. Again, telling you here, then also going through and saying that, okay, if you're looking at something that's kind of a cord compression or anything else going on, there's no basic upper motor neuron signs in this individual. We're going to have nowhere near the time to go into biomechanical, but here's the deal. Never thought we'd get through this anyway, but you should be able to. And I can see a few of you got into this. Many of you did not get into this article. This is a difficult article to read in a sense, but you have all the base knowledge to be able to work your way through it and end up where they end up in this. Meaning that, okay, they're going to look at seated techniques. And even if the seated technique is slightly different than what we've done, you take a moment to read it and look at it and think through the biomechanics they describe because they're using the same cervical biomechanics that we would use. They're going to check extension of the facet joint and seated. He's going to come on and on this side, brace the, you know, the bottom and the left hand side is going to stabilize C3, you know, side bend and for side bend right, rotate right, extend over C3 and glide C3 up under C2 to check extension, you know. So you should be able, or it's OA, but it's the same mechanics. You should be able to work through the mechanics that they talk about to come up with, you know, the biomechanical dysfunction. You have all the skills and all the knowledge. Look at how they're doing the techniques differently, but start to think through the biomechanics. And that's where if you have questions, put them out on the discussion board is what I'm going to ask you to do. Is, yep. hey, I don't understand this the mechanics. They're describing this technique. Get out and we can go over it. You should be able to kind of now start to, in your mind, work through different techniques using what we've done. Just challenging, and it's going to get much easier through the next two courses. So this one really kind of pushes everyone a little bit to kind of understand what we've learned and where we are, and then now be able to do different things with it. Real quickly here, as you get into this, I recommend reading this if you haven't already. Differentials they found after they did their biomechanical exam, you know, they diagnosed cervogenic headache. Also, infrequent migraine headaches in there as well from the symptom. Biomechanical dysfunction, occiput on C1. And then mechanical dysfunction, you know, right rotation, C1 on C2. And mechanical dysfunction, right zygopophyseal joint, 2, 3. So a bunch of stuff going on on the right. But 20-year history. That's not even it. I think there's more. Yeah. Moving on down here. Bam. Yeah. Painful arthrosis and oncovertebral joints, uh, 2, 3. This would be a capsular pattern that you're going to find in these joints where it does a capsular restriction versus a dam or a painful increased hypermobility. Yeah, painful internal disc disruption, C5, C6. They're basing that off the, the images they saw in the x-ray and the kyphosis and the flattening of that segment, I believe. I don't believe the MRI showed anything. Uh, mechanical dysfunction, right rotation, T2, T3. So here we're getting that right rotation, that interscapular pain with that right rotation. Biomechanical dysfunction and traction, uh, right costotransverse joints, ribs, two, three. So they're, they use the seated glide technique. Set it up differently than we do, but when you look at the end result, I think they're doing a posterior lateral and a ventromedial glide. They just do it with setting up the head position and position the joint and seated. I, we tend to do it in prone or we can do it mechanically with movement, rotation, arm elevation, or trunk. Yeah, I, I I disagree with their mechanics on their rib mobilizations because mm -hmm. they, were, they were fixing the left side um, transverse process to, do, yeah. to produce a posterior lateral glide. And it's just like, well, no, that's going to rotate the rib this way. And mm -hmm. you're trying to do this. Relatively, you're putting yeah. it into the same moment. Um, so it did, yeah. 
I mean, yeah, but I thought, I thought it was a bit much. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was the mechanics weren't correct on how they were doing that. Um, which, you know, who knows? I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be sold that their assessment would imply that you have both uh, facet joint issues and costo transverse. Who's having the stroke now? Costo transverse mm -hmm. issues um, in the same segment all at the same time. That seems unlikely. It's more likely it's just one and the other is being adapted to. And that, that's why it's given them that abnormal end feel. But their end feels were all over the map too. It was like they described them as hard or stiff. Um, you know, not not actually describing what tissue it was that was limiting the movement. Um, so it was just, you know, little things like that. And but you know what? Their patient got better. So I guess I guess things worked out. I mean, granted, it took them three months and 24 visits um to, to get them to that situation, <laughs> but they spent, I think, eight visits doing just interferential and um, you know, things like that to start out with. So it's just like, well, we kind of wasted eight visits right off the hop there by doing doing that stuff only. Um 10 visits. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a long time of that sort of stuff and stretching, which you know, when when we talk about stretching stuff, I, I look at it from perspective of if we're if we're dealing with muscles that are tight because of abnormal mechanoreceptor input. So that would be probably the scalenes or facilitation with the levator, um, et cetera. We're fighting the central nervous system with that and we're gonna lose. Um, so there's there's just no point in doing any of that type of stretching before you take care of the articular problems. Um, Cause you're, you're just gonna, you might get it to loosen up a little bit but it's gonna go right back there because that neurophys input that's causing that to be tight in the first place is still there and unless you take that away you're not going to get any improvement with stretching so there's there's a lot of stuff there and how they went about doing their original treatments that i don't agree with um, and we can talk more about why that is going forward so yeah not to waste any more any bit of any yeah. time. so if you have an opinion if you want to go further this one's fine you can do it on your own at some point i was going to get into what nobody feels like probably really digging into but it'd probably be good to put some TMJ in here since we tend not to be able to get to it in detail. I have so videos maybe, of that too. If you want me to send them to you, Dave, if you have videos of it, you may have for that, kick it over and that may be good to do. And we'll, it won't go heavily into making you a TMJ expert, but to be able to tie the cervical spine to the TMJ and understand a basic, a, a cursory TMJ screening procedure at some point may be good. Yeah. I, I have videos of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I can I can upload that onto the Dropbox too. It may be good that way. Easier than emailing them. Yeah, it's 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 better than trying to okay either you get the cervical course and you can spend time somewhere else, and or or if not, it's easier to introduce in the cervical course because you don't have to teach it outright. Well, and it's it's it was tough for a couple of years during COVID. We didn't get a chance to do it because we couldn't take off masks and all that stuff. And so yeah. getting hands in people's mouths is like, yeah, we're not allowed to do that. So here's some mm -hmm. videos. So I have those. Um, so mm -hmm. if we need them, we can use we can use that stuff to do TMJ. All right, good. Hopefully that wasn't too painful for everybody. Just for me. Yeah. I'm reading it. <laughs> um, real quick, Dave, should I plan on doing the be being there in Chicago in July? Could you? I'm gonna make I'll make one last ditch effort to talk to him to see that if this Arizona course is going. I know you have plans. But either way, well, I, think... I, I can do it. It's just I wanted to let people know that I either was going to be thing. available. Or not. Yeah. I can certainly yes. go and do the class. It's not a problem. Yeah, it might be good. It might be good if you did that one. I, Arizona is just going to be like a basically a, a bridged version of a module one. Yeah, you know, we're doing. I'll just plan so... on that then. I'll start making my start making my arrangements yeah. to get out there for for that. That's cool. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Nah, not a problem. All Happy right. to do it. All right. Take yeah. care. Yep.